I'm Daniel Vitalis, and you're listening to The Wild Fed Podcast, a show about reconnecting with nature through hunting, fishing, foraging, and food. Wild Fed. Food is all around you. Welcome to the inaugural episode of the Wild Fed Podcast. As the show intro and title suggest, this is a show about wild foods. More specifically, it's a show about hunting, fishing, and foraging wild foods, and also about processing and cooking them, really about the associated lifestyle. Wild Foods generates this incredible lifestyle that is about so much more than just the food. Um, It is an invitation into ecology. And I think this is a really good time in history for a show like this one because so many people are feeling so completely disconnected from the natural world. Our lives are becoming so technological, we're becoming more and more sort of transhuman. And as that happens, there's this uh, sort of void left in us uh, where our connection to the natural world should be. And so a lot of us are looking for a way back to the natural world. And I'm somebody who spent a lot of my life in the outdoors, but not as a real participant in ecology. I was using the outdoors like a, uh, a kind of place to recreate. So it would be uh, a place to hike, a place to climb, a place to swim, a place to paddle, but uh, almost like it was the stage uh, for a play. Now, through Wild Foods, my lifestyle feels a lot more like I'm an integral part of ecosystems. And so this show is an invitation. If that's something that you've never felt before or haven't experienced, this show is an invitation to you. Not just into the world of Wild Foods, that's almost the Trojan horse of it, but it's a real invitation to reconnect yourself, to plug yourself back in to nature in a really deep, a really profound way. If you're somebody who already hunts or fishes or forages, this show is also for you because we're going to go deep into the lifestyle and we're going to be talking to some incredible people who partake in that lifestyle or sometimes who are um, experts on real specific aspects of things that could really inform uh, your practices. So um, this is going to be a really well-rounded show. Um, In the future, episodes will primarily be interviews. There'll be interviews with uh, biologists, with uh, game wardens, with conservationists, with chefs uh, who work with wild foods, with authors who've written books uh, on topics that um, circle back around this topic that we're, t- we're discussing now. Um, there'll be shows with friends of mine who I think can bring a lot of really good content to episodes. And of course, we'll be talking to people who hunt, who fish, and who forage. Uh, I'll be doing some solo shows too about getting you started in the lifestyle. If this is something that's new for you, I'll be talking about equipment and skills and you know how to get involved in things that can be a little bit daunting at first. So I hope this show is a good introduction if you're new to this lifestyle. And like I said, if you're somewhat seasoned in it, I hope that you find content here that really helps you. I want to kind of start off by saying... Uh, Uh, real clearly that I'm not claiming to represent wild food culture in any way here. This is just my take on wild food culture. And uh, I'm going to be talking about my interests and experiences. So there's a lot of people who've been doing this a lot longer than I have. I mean, really, when you think about human history, we have, you could kind of argue three and a half million years of evolutionary history of hunting, fishing, and foraging for our food. So, um, of course, each one of us who partakes in this lifestyle is just the next iteration, the next sort of generation of forager, really. Um, But that said, in my own lifetime, I certainly have a lot of people in my life who are more experienced at it than me. So I'm not coming at this as an expert. I'm coming at it as a learner, and I'm inviting you on the journey with me. In addition to this podcast... Uh, which will be coming out every Tuesday. So this will be a weekly show. Uh, There is also a video show. You know, some of you may have uh, followed my previous podcast, which was called Rewild Yourself. And I did that show for something like 100 and I think 178 episodes. Similar in that uh, it was primarily interviews with experts 
And then it would also be some solo shows that I would do on my own. Now, the topic there is a little bit different. My focus in that show was the idea of human wildness. And in particular, is it possible that human beings had become a domesticated animal in the process of domesticating other animals, domesticating plants, fungi, landscapes in general? Had we domesticated ourselves? And if we had, had were there things that we had lost? And in the exploration of that uh, topic, I got drawn deeper and deeper into the world of wild food. I had already been a forager, but um, I think I was more of really like a dabbler in it. And over the course of doing that show, it ran for a few years, I just kept finding myself, I just kept following that thread. And it led me deeper and deeper into just this incredible and strange lifestyle where before I knew it, my interest in plants went from sort of trail nibbles to serious harvests. And then I started to realize that if I integrated hunting in my life, I could really start to become food self-sufficient, at least protein self-sufficient, and uh, and followed that journey, learned how to fish, learned how to hunt, learned how to forage in a serious way. And over time, started to realize that I was bringing so much of that into Rewild Yourself that maybe it was time to shut that podcast down, take a couple years to go deeper into what I was learning, and then bring a new show forward. So that's what I'm doing uh, now. It's been a couple of years since I podcasted. However, back to what I was saying a moment ago, there's a video show component to this as well. And that's because the last couple of years, as I've been on this learning journey, I have been documenting it, working with a great producer, Grant Giuliano. You'll be meeting him in future episodes. Um, and we have been creating a, I'm going to call it a television show. It's not going to be airing on networks. At least that's not the plan. Uh, but it is follows that format uh, in that it is a show with an intro and uh, multiple scenes that are interspersed and an arc to the story um, and outro credits. You know, it's not a YouTube video. It's a full on show. And the first season is done and it is eight episodes. Uh, so not only does each episode follow an arc, but the season kind of follows an arc as well because it begins in the spring and it runs through the season till the eighth episode ending out in the snow. So you'll get to see the entire sort of last season, uh, last couple seasons, because we are currently uh, wrapping up filming for season two. So um, in addition to this podcast, which uh, you'll be able to get anywhere that you get podcasts, um, I'll be telling you a little bit how you can see the video show as well. So really, really excited for you to see that part of it. Um, podcasting for me is a real joy. It is an awesome opportunity to get to communicate in long form. Doing the video show is really fun as well because it's like an art project for me. Um, I get to really showcase these different um, plant species, animal species, fungi species, algae, like all these really cool, I want to say characters. Um, and that's because for me, when I think about species, it's like they're living things. Um, I like the idea of like non-human persons, because as you get to know these organisms, you realize, hey, some of these organisms massively predate human beings. We give personage to one another and maybe to our pets, but sometimes we, we neglect to give that to species that have been here a lot longer than us. And so the video show is about hunting, fishing, and foraging and bringing that food out off the landscape and into the kitchen. But it's also an opportunity to introduce you to species that maybe you haven't met yet. Um, each episode of that show, by the way, uh, sort of follows a general theme, which is that we typically what we're doing, um, there's a little variation, particularly in the second season, but um, in general, we harvest some protein. So that could be through uh, fishing, it could be through hunting, it could be through what anthropologists call collecting. I like to call that micro game hunting. So that could be something like if you were collecting oysters or clams, right? It's not really hunting. It's not really fishing, sort of in between. Uh, but we gather some protein and then we get some plant or fungi or algae. And so that could be, like I said, a plant, specifically something botanical. It could be a mushroom, something mycological, or it could be an algae, which fit into their own kingdom. They're the protists. So when I say algae, I'm referring to things like seaweeds. Um, and we get something like that, a non-animal food, and we bring those ingredients out into the kitchen. They either go uh, 
to my kitchen where I'll be preparing those. Or very often what we're doing in the show is, is connecting with a cook or a chef, uh, sometimes in a restaurant environment, sometimes in a home, sometimes outside where that food gets turned into a really awesome meal. And what we do is bring everybody together to share in it. So that show is actually available uh, now on wild-fed.com. I'll be explaining how you can actually get it and see it. I should say that uh, the opportunity to buy into the show exists now, uh, but uh, it won't be available the first episode until January 6th of 2020. So that's when we'll be putting out the first episode. I'll give you all the details on that in a little bit. But basically, both the podcast and a show and the video show are this invitation to you to, if you have never done this, to gently start experimenting with food from your landscape. And if you already participate, to go even deeper, to go further, to broaden your skill set, to start experimenting more, to start learning about more species, to start uh, accessing what's available on your landscape. But I also hope that there are folks who will listen to the show or follow the video show as well that don't necessarily intend to do any of that, but are simply interested in learning more about human ecology, how human beings relate to ecosystems. So I'm going to be doing this show in the most non-dogmatic and moderate, most balanced way that I can. I'm not always really good at that. I'm, I tend to jump all the way in, uh, and I'm pretty all in on this as well. Um, but I'll be doing my very best to, to keep this show, uh, particularly the video show, um, very watchable, very entertaining. I have this interest in merging three things when I do a project. That's art, education, and entertainment. So for me, uh, it's hard for me to consume. Let's say I was, you know, we go to YouTube and we start to uh, look up videos because there's something we want to learn about. It can be difficult for me to consume a video, even if I really want to know about the topic, if the video is poorly put together, if there's no art to it. That can be a little bit challenging to me. So I like there to be an artistic component, um, but I don't just want to see art because art sometimes is very, really boring to me if there's not an entertaining aspect to it. So I don't want it delivered to me just beautifully, but I want it delivered to me in a way that engages me as entertaining. But I also don't like just entertainment. Otherwise, I'd just be hanging out at the amusement park. So I want an educational component. I want to be learning. I like to have that part of my mind engaged. And I think a lot of you do too. So uh, the goal with the show, in particular with the video show, is that it is all three of those things. It's artistically shot, it's entertaining in how it's put together, but you'll always leave having learned something, having gained something from it. Like I said, the podcast is going to be an opportunity to go longer form, so the two really go hand in hand. So if you're listening to the show right now, I hope you'll uh, consider watching the video show too and getting in on that. Um, I think you'll really like it. Um, like I was saying before, I, another component I want to add to this is just that um, there's a lot of ways to approach all the things we're going to be talking about here on the show. And there's something uh, that I picked up in education years ago, and I, it's a saying, and I, I think it applies to the content we're going to be covering here. And that's that um, there's a lot of uh, wrong ways to do things. There's a lot of right ways to do things. And then there's the way we're going to do it today, right? So as I was saying before, this is just sort of how I approach it. And uh, you could listen to somebody else talking about the same topic and they are going to approach it very differently. And I, de I don't ever want it to feel like um, there's conflict there because for me, there's not. It's just individual approach. And I'm just excited to share my passions with you guys here. So um, a little bit about me and how I arrived at this because this has been a big journey for me. I've been interested in food my whole life or, or really going back into my early teens I had a pretty rough upbringing and a kind of a challenging start in life. And food, I think, was like the first thing that I realized I could affect the outcome of my life a little bit if I had some discipline around it. So I was experimenting with food pretty early on and using food as a tool uh, for kind of personal development. Um, that led me in a, a bit of a wayward path for a while. One, I'm grateful to have circumnavigated, but... Um, 
led me a little bit astray from where I'm at now. So in my 20s, I got really deep. My late teens, I got into vegetarianism. And by my 20s, I was deep into the world of veganism and, and in fact, raw food veganism. It's a pretty hardcore diet that I was on. Uh, if some of you listening will have experimented with it or be familiar with it. And um, I did that for a long time. It, I did it about 10 years. And um, looking back, there's a term now for folks who go deep into these kind of things that they use in psychology and in medicine, it's uh, orthorexia. It's like, imagine uh, somebody who's anorexic and somebody who's anorexic might uh, look at themselves and think um, that they are too overweight, even though from the outside, they'll look underweight, but it's like a, a distortion of body image. Well, orthorexia, ortho means like right or correct. It's a little bit different. It's like an obsession with eating the right food and thinking that other foods are the wrong foods or toxic foods are bad for you. And I got, I got just waylaid into that. The reason I did is I was very interested in the idea of what are natural foods for humans. Because there's so many species we can look at. Like if you pull up the Wikipedia on any species, you can just go down to the diet section, right? And go like, what does this animal eat? And here's its diet. But with people, it's so much more complex. It was, it's more complex than I wanted to accept in my 20s. By the way, I'm 42 right now as I'm recording this, just to give you some perspective. So uh, in my 20s, I just couldn't really grasp the complexity of human diet. But that is fundamental to uh, my personal mission on Earth, I think. It's just like I part of what I do on this planet is sort through this stuff. It's, my, it's just my passion and my interest. So I was trying to figure that out and, and I had been kind of convinced by folks that, that veganism was a natural way for people to eat and that we had been sort of waylaid as a species, confused as a species. And we had started eating like, you know, the forbidden fruit in the garden of Eden or something was, you know, meats. And later I got kind of, con it was, I found, it was compelling to me at the time, you know, early days of the internet. Um, it was a compelling argument to me. And I was also convinced that cooking food was something that wasn't natural for people to do too. I've since uh, learned a lot. There's a lot there. And I explored some of that in uh, the Rewild Yourself podcast. Anybody who's interested in that too might want to go back and check out the episode I did called Why I'm Not a Vegan, where I really sort of break that down. Um, but I spent quite a bit of time doing that. Eventually became part of the sort of network of people who um, write books on these topics. And eventually in my thirties was, um, invited to give lectures and to tour and to speak all over North America and, and really around the world, uh, South America, sometimes in Europe too. Um, however, by my thirties, I had realized that this diet didn't make sense. And I was invited still into, uh, these speaking engagements where I would have crowds of vegans and I was no longer vegan and I was no longer doing raw foods. I was, uh, experimenting beyond that. So, um, I started teaching publicly uh, about the ideas that we kind of now have language around, like we call paleo diets or things like that, where, um, you know, really looking anthropologically at what human beings naturally eat. And so that became a deep interest of mine and, and getting people on board with what I later realized were natural human diets by studying anthropology a bit. Um, you know, I built a company during that time too, in my thirties and that company called Sir Thrival, uh, it's a nutritional supplement company, uh, was successful and created a lot of opportunity for me to really explore my interests. And so by my mid thirties, I got really deep into this idea of wild food and decided that I wanted to learn to hunt. Um, I saw that you know, it's very difficult. One of the things that really helps a person understand that, you know, veganism is not a, a natural diet for people is when they try to do it off of wild foods. It's very easy to do veganism from a supermarket, but when you go out on the landscape and attempt it, it becomes much more complicated. Uh, and you start to understand the important role that animal foods play in people's lives through time. So, um, I got, you know, my problem, my hunter safety class in my earlier mid thirties. And then it took me a few years to really find an inroad and figure out how to get started. And uh, I've spent now from uh, my mid thirties until uh, recording this, I've been learning how to do it. And I got to say that uh, once you get going, it can be a pretty uh, easy process to become protein self-sufficient. So if that's something you're interested in, but you're not there yet, I just want to tell you that um, you can do it. 
uh, you, you need some mentors, you need to learn some skills, you know, you'll need some help along the way. You'll need some expert input. Um, we're going to try to provide a lot of that here on this show by bringing in the right people for you to talk to, or for you to hear from, I should say. Um, and I'm hoping that the video show becomes a, a big inspiration to you as well, but I just want you to know that's something you can do. I was able to figure it out anyway. And, um, man, I'm not looking back. It's uh, I was out hunting this morning. There's another saying I really like, which is, uh, chop wood, carry water. Or I think the whole saying is, uh, before enlightenment, chop wood, carry water after enlightenment, chop wood, carry water. So for me, there's, um, I want to, I want to apply that in two ways. One is that, um, I feel like we are all on this, we're all living in a age of enlightenment. Uh, by that, I mean, sort of, we are living in the age of the internet and, um, many of you listening will remember, um, using the card catalog at the library. Like if you were researching anything, like how you got information in the past, um, and how, um, little bandwidth there was, you know, it was very difficult to access information that wasn't mainstream because, uh, libraries tended to stock books that were more mainstream and, um, information was controlled in a sense, not, you know, I don't mean it in an Orwellian way, but, uh, there was, it, we only saw what was published. Now everybody can be a publisher, of course. And so we're living through this era where our awareness, of the world around us has been just tremendously exponentially expanded. So that's like a kind of enlightenment. And I, th I think a lot of people are getting really confused <laughs> about how to live now. And for me, this idea of hunting, fishing, and foraging is like chopping wood and carrying water. It's like, um, okay, we, we get all this information. What do you do with it? Well, you still have to do the basic things to take care of yourself. And so for me, the practice of hunting, fishing, and foraging is like a way of um, staying sane in this really chaotic time. And then on a personal level, I feel like that too. I, you know, I spent a lot of time studying nutrition. I spent a couple decades really focused on it, tried a lot of different dietary approaches, got to meet a lot of the experts, got to meet a lot of the people who wrote the books. And you find out pretty quick that a lot of those people don't live what they talk about. And uh, if you're in that world and um, got exposed to just, uh, you know, a, lo a lot of cutting edge information about food. And in the end, started to find that it was very confusing. That kind of enlightenment of information um, ultimately wasn't extremely useful to me. It was more overwhelming. Um, if you study nutrition, even in a tertiary way, you know what I'm talking about. We have, there's, it's fashionable too. It's like, you, you find out, you know, one day that eggs are good for you. And then you find out two weeks later, eggs are bad for you. And then you find out two weeks later, eggs are good for you again. And then you find out, well, they're only good for you if you have the whites. And then you find out, no, it's only good for you if you have the yolks. And then you find out, no, they're, they're both bad. And then they're both good again. And it just keeps changing and changing and changing. So for me, the practice of hunting, fishing, and foraging is also a way to deal with the, the, the chaos of information that I uncovered for myself in the process of trying to study human food and just wanting something simple and saying like, is it possible for me to kind of step outside of, you know, actually I'll add a sort of third enlightenment to that, which is um, obviously I don't mean enlightenment in the sort of Buddhist sense here. I mean, in the accessing of information, um, many of us have sort of become awakened to um, what goes on in our industrial food system. So everything from CAFO farming or factory farming uh, to genetically modified plants, now animals, algae, fungi, all that kind of stuff, you know, that a lot of us sort of have a deep resonant sense inside of ourselves, not good. Um, even if there isn't, you know, even if there's a quagmire where there should be good science, like, or maybe even if we determine these foods are absolutely safe, um, a lot of us still, it just doesn't, there's a certain type of person it doesn't sit well with. If you offered me cloned sheep, would I be interested in it? Not really. I mean, if I was starving, but not really that interested in it. But every day people are eating cloned apples, right? It's like, it's, I don't like it. Uh, so the awareness of that led me to kind of ask myself, where do I get natural foods? And I reverse engineered that a little bit because I knew where I wanted to get to, but it was like, well, I had to buy organic food at the supermarket for a while. And then 
the farmer's market revolution kind of kicked back on in the United States. You know, that wasn't a thing 15 years ago and I could get access to locally grown food and then slowly started to learn more about wild foods and how I could access them. Now I still get organic food at the supermarket. I still get food from the farmer's market food. I'm really grateful for, but, um, but what I can get from my own efforts in the wild, I do. And I really like to. So, you know, that kind of brings me to this sort of conversation about how personally, how I'm looking at wild foods and the, the process of, of accessing them, because there are places in the world where that's a subsistence practice, you know, parts of the United States, even like in Alaska, where, you know, people harvest wild food, particularly game because of the difficulty of having to purchase it or the extreme high prices of having to purchase it in such remote areas. And then of course the world over, we still have something like a hundred uncontacted tribes living as hunter gatherers, living in what is effectively the stone age still, um, in that they don't smelt metals, you know, and that their tools are still, you know, unless they get metal tools through trade networks, they're still essentially living in the stone age, hunting and gathering. Uh, that's true subsistence. That's not really what I'm doing. I can go to the store and buy food. I mean, take me 10 minutes and I can be to a supermarket. So uh, it's not really subsistence. But when you look at a lot of uh, folks who hunt and fish, they approach it as a sport. Um, I mean, I hear it all the time, actually, when I'm out, out with people. You know, recently was bear hunting this season, and somebody said, you know, thank you for introducing me to this sport. And it was like, wow, this is, for me, this is not a sport. I don't see it like that. Um, I don't approach living things in that way. That's just not, you know, that's just not how I, I personally approach it. Um, it's not to criticize other people's approach, but it's just, that's not my approach. And so it's not really, it's not really subsistence. It's not really a sport. I started to think about it more like a practice. So if you think about something like maybe, I don't know, yoga is a really good example where yoga is not, um, really a sport. I mean, some people approach it that way too, but it's not really a sport. Um, it's more than exercise for the people who, who do it. It's something in between. It's like a practice, you know, meditations like that, I guess, a practice. And I see this practice of hunting, fishing, and foraging as a way to, let's say that you, you saw meditation as a way to approach consciousness, um, or you used yoga as a way to approach consciousness. Well, you can use hunting, fishing, and foraging as a way to approach nature to reintegrate yourself into nature. So that's how I see it. And that's going to be thematic throughout this show. Um, you'll sense it in the video show, in the Wild Fed show, but you'll, you'll hear more of, of it. You'll, be, you'll hear it spoken more here on the podcast. And as I was saying before, I mean, so for me, this is really about having relationships to species. I think about this term anti-fragility, to be anti-fragile. You know, it means that when systems break down, you don't just, it's not just staying strong when systems breaks down, break down. It's that when systems break down, you are actually stronger. <laughs> That's really interesting. Uh, so maybe being durable would be, you know, if things break down, you stay strong. That's durability. Anti-fragility is that when things break down, your skills make you uh, more successful than you are when things are intact, so to speak. So there's this aspect to our lives where we are so technological and we rely on so many systems that many of us have doffed over time, especially generationally, like uh, in our lineages, we have doffed many of the skills that uh, are needed to live on a landscape in a more in a, in a less supported way, in a more natural way. Um, however, if we have some of those skills, you may not necessarily need them right now. In fact, you might have to utilize them in practice only. But if you ever did need them, you're very anti-fragile because if you needed them, it's because everybody needs them. And if everybody needs them, that puts you in this really interesting position of having those skills. And so the more species we meet, it's like that too. We become more anti-fragile in that we don't rely so heavily on just our network of social media friends, for instance. We have friends that transcend not just you know, the virtual world to the natural world, but actually transcend our species in that 
you have non-human friends. So if you are somebody who forages 15 plants and hunts three or four land animals and uh, fishes three or four species of aquatic animal and know an algae or two and a fungi or two that you can harvest, now you have this network of species that you're connected to. You're interwoven into these landscapes and you're anti-fragile. Like you have this skill set that makes you stronger. Um, and I think in your day to day too, because there's like a kind of confidence. If you look at the last, I'd say the last decade in particular, there's been this rise in everything from like zombie shows to apocalypse media to prepping and all those kind of like survivalist type things. You know, anywhere you go now, there's like all these books, like, you know, survival 101 books and such. And I think it's because deep in the psychology, at least here in the United States, Americans, we have this awareness in our psyche of how far out on a limb we have gotten with the way that we live. And that's not to say that we couldn't go on like this for some time. Now, I think like one thing to note, we say that our lifestyle currently isn't sustainable. So that means that it can't go on forever. It's, that's what not sustainable means. So it will change, if not end, it will change. Uh, it will have to. Um, that doesn't mean we'll ever need to hunt, fish, and forage, though, for our survival. I don't mean to suggest that, but I think that this knowledge in us that we have lost those skills creates this sort of internal discomfort, a lack of confidence. And we express that in all of this apocalyptic media. And um, we kind of have this obsession with, I mean, you even see it in, in reality shows where it's like naked and afraid or survivor, things like that, where we kind of have this interest in who can survive those kind of things. The hunger games is another example of that. Like who can survive um, is interesting to us because we're aware that we have lost a lot of that. And so I think that there's this confidence that you develop once you start to make connections to species and you start to make connections to places. So I'm going to shift gears here a little bit and talk about that because a big part of this project for me is I want to see open spaces preserved. I want to see land preserved. I want to see ecosystems kept intact. That's important to me. And I think it's very difficult to do that. Even when you have people who care about the environment, but don't live a lifestyle that puts them into that environment. Very difficult to get people to actually preserve anything, except that they'll express it verbally or emotionally, but action is the challenging part to initiate because people aren't actually invested in those open spaces very often because they don't extract anything from those places. So no question, hunting, fishing, and foraging are consumptive use um, practices. They are consumptive of things on the landscape. However, we do them, especially here in the United States where hunting is, is tremendously regulated as is fishing, foraging less so, interestingly, due to the way that laws are set up. And that's something we'll explore ad nauseum in this, you know, podcast over time. But ideally, the practices of hunting, fishing and foraging are done in a way that is renewable in a way that is sustainable. So it's consumptive, but it's not consumptive the way, let's say, strip mining is consumptive. Um, or, you know, clear cutting is consumptive. That takes more than can be replenished. Um, it's not a, it's not a, like a win-win scenario. So when practiced properly and when managed properly, our use is compensatory. It's not additive. So clear cutting would be like additive mortality of trees. Like you're taking more trees than, uh, are being born in that area. Um, when it's compensatory, what's happening is we are taking uh, less than are recruited into the population every year. So a population can continue to grow. You know, I brought up bear hunting earlier, um, obviously a controversial hunt and something that we'll be exploring in both the video show and in future podcasts. But here in Maine, where I live, we have grown the bear population whilst having over-the-counter tags available for hunting. So you would think, wow, if they're able to just purchase tags to hunt bears and we 
harvest on average something like 2,900 bears or so, just under 3,000 bears a year here in Maine, you'd think, wow, that's got to have a really negative impact on the population. But actually, more bears are recruited each year into the adult population than we harvest. And so it's actually a growing population of bears here. In fact, growing to the point that wildlife managers are, are looking for more hunters to harvest more bears because their population is growing too rapidly. So that's what we're talking about here. We're talking about um, judicious use of resources on the landscape. So when you use things from your landscape, judiciously like that, when you extract something but not so much that you cause depletion or, or denude a landscape, you start to become very invested in that place. Uh, so for instance, if you have a place where you harvest acorns, or you have a place where you harvest nettles, or you have a place where you harvest uh, maitake mushrooms, or you have a place where you hang a tree stand to hunt deer, or you have a landscape that you go up into to hunt elk, or you know, on and on and on, um, if you find out that that landscape is going to be developed, if you find out that there are plans to denude that landscape, you now have, you're a stakeholder. You really, really care about that uh, because there's something that you utilize from that landscape that could be threatened or even lost. Contrast that with somebody who lives in an urban environment and um, really cares about the environment, emotionally is very invested in this idea of saving the environment but does not have a relationship to place um, where they go and actually utilize things off any particular landscape. When you have a kind of scenario like that, it can lead to things like, for instance, this idea of carbon offset credits. And I don't mean to, I'm not trying to say, I don't even know enough about carbon offset credits to criticize them. It's not my intention to criticize that right now, as much as to say, it's strange to me as an idea where it's like, well, yeah, we're going to destroy this piece over here, but we're going to invest in this place over here. Well, if that place you're destroying is a place where I harvest food from, I'm not going to want you to do that. Uh, but if I don't have a relationship to either place and you say, well, they're pretty much equal, I'm going to kind of ruin this one, but we're going to fix up this one. It's like, oh yeah, that sounds great. Uh, so I think that as people start to develop relationships to place through the process of hunting, fishing, and foraging, you know, or, and, and to, to broaden that out, that could be medicine making. Like maybe it's somebody who's interesting and in, interested in herbal medicine or, um, somebody who woodcrafts and there are, you know, particular stands of trees there that they harvest from or whatever it is. When you have, uh, uh, something that you utilize from the landscape, that's when you get people who are really willing to speak up to protect places, open spaces. So part of this show is about connecting people to species and part of it's about connecting people to place. One of the sort of ideas I'm going to come to these in just a minute um, here at WildFed, you know, as a company, one of the things we're really interested in is um, being made of place. And so I'll get to that in just a second, actually. Um, let me tell you first a little bit about um, WildFed as an organization. So if you go over to wild-fed.com, you can see our mission statement and a bit about our core values. Uh, but I'll go through those a little bit here. So, of course, the show is called Wild Fed because for me, it was sort of like the idea of a grass fed cow, right? Like when you eat wild foods, you're wild fed. Uh, the mission is connecting people with wildness through food. Very simple. It's like, how do we ultimately where we want to get to is people being connected to wild places and wild species. That's my goal. Uh, with this, pro with this um, project. It's like, I want people through this podcast and through the video show to deepen their relationship to wild things, because we are very rapidly domesticating the entire planet. We are now moving into domesticating the oceans, the way that we're uh, beginning to farm them. And uh, I know that I don't mean to really open that whole subject up here. There's a lot to it and arguments for and against, but but we are in the process of of domesticating the entire planet. I was talking before about how there's still like this uncontacted tribes out there, maybe something about like a hundred of them. Um, but that will probably end in my lifetime, I would assume, um, because things are unfolding very quickly. So the connection to wild places and the connection to wild species, without that connection to wildness, we're going to lose so much of the diversity. Uh, that makes this planet so special. And 
food, I think, is the doorway for a lot of people because it's so personal and it's so intimate. My friend Arthur Haynes, who you'll see a lot in the video show, and you'll also hear him on this podcast, uh, fans of Rewild Yourself will remember uh, him, of course, from many episodes we did together. Um, he's a colleague of mine, my sort of my foraging, really my foraging mentor. Um, he talks a lot about the idea of food as the sort of supreme intimate act, eating as the supreme intimate act. You know, he points out that eating food is the process of taking a species or a piece of a species, right? Because think about living, think about foods, they're living things, right? Or they might be dead now, but they started as living things. Like the foods that we eat are the bodies and body parts of other things. But some people don't understand that actually, you know, I, I've explained that to folks before and realized midway through like, oh, they don't, they didn't, they didn't ever think about that. But we can't just, uh, synth we can't make synthetic food yet. We don't yet have that ability. Uh, the food that we eat all comes from living things. They're, the only exceptions, we have a couple of tissues that we eat where it, it'll be like um, dairy products can, are extruded by a living thing. Um, honey is extruded by living things. But all of it came from some life form. But typically, what we're when we eat, we're eating the body parts of things, um, or we're eating the whole body itself. Um, that could be from many different kingdoms of life. So uh, it could be plant, could be animal, could be fungi, could be algae. But we consume living things. Then we bring those into our body, and we make our body out of them. So he points out, like, yes, sex is very intimate in that you. Um, intertwine your bodies physically, but not to the level of what you do with food. That's the supremely intimate act. And we all do it. We all eat every day. We're all eating. And so food is this thing we all relate to. And when you tie food to wildness, it, it's just a powerful combination because it creates a, a, like I've been saying, like a desire to protect your food's resources, of course, right? So um, to me, the mission of connecting people with wildness through food, I just think food's the doorway through which many people will make relationships to wild things. The tagline for the show is food is all around you. I love this idea because to me, it, there's like adventure encoded into that because food is all around you. And in this case, I'm talking about wild foods, right? They're all around you, but most of us don't know how to access most of them. So even here on this landscape where I live, there are dozens of species that I harvest. Um, I harvest quite a few different plant species throughout the season. I participate in most of the hunts that are legal to do here, uh, as well as most of the fisheries, many of the fisheries, I should say, not most, many. Um, I harvest quite a few different mushrooms and fungal, you know, body parts, because not all are mushrooms, but um, sclerotia as well, you know, mycelia. Um, yeasts, things like that. Um, I harvest seaweeds out of the sea here, algaes, um, even sometimes lichens. Uh, so, you know, I've got all of these different species that I harvest, but there's so much here that I don't even know about. There are so many plant species. You know, I mentioned Arthur Haynes earlier when I'm out with him, you know, he, he just knows so many species. Um, it makes me feel like such a neophyte. Uh, so there's just so much out there. And to me, it's like this great Easter egg hunt, this search for this food that's all around us. So I hope that that tagline kind of inspires you a little bit to start looking at your, the world around you, your landscape a little bit differently. Like, is that food? Is that food? Now it's not an encouragement to go try things without learning about them first, because there's all sorts of inherent risks in doing that. But the idea that you might be trotting upon things you might be stepping over things or walking past things that are incredible food resources and not even knowing it. I don't know. There's something about that that intrigues me and is exciting. Uh, like I said before, if you go over to wild-fed.com and go to the about page, there's a page there called, uh, or on that menu, there's a page called who we are. And, and in that we discuss our different um, core values. And so I'm going to just go through those quickly, give you a sense of them. So the first one is harvest your own food. And I'm, I mentioned this before about my own diet. It's like, I, 
you know, we go to the, to the supermarket, we go to the farmer's market, we go to Whole Foods, and we buy a lot of foods at these places. Uh, but we also eat a large amount of wild food, and that percentage is always growing. So when I say harvest your own food, I don't mean it like exclusively. I don't know anyone that does that exclusively. There are those tribes I mentioned before who still live completely uh, at a subsistence level, hunting and gathering. Uh, but, you know, in the modern world where I live in the, I shouldn't say modern world, I don't think that's really fair. Those are modern people. Uh, but in the um, developed world, in the technologically advanced world that we live in, I don't know anybody that just subsists on wild food. I know people who subsist exclusively on game meat. Uh, we, we do that largely here, except when we eat out or, you know, somebody has us over or something, but, but we do that here, but certainly aren't able to do all of our calories this way. Um, so when I say harvest your own food, I'm not saying it like exclusively, but I'm saying, um, find something, get started, find a food, find a food that you can harvest. Even if it's just one thing, you know, today I was out uh, hunting and came upon a stand of feral apple trees. And some of them, even though there was frost on the ground, still retained apples. You know, um, when you deal with what a lot of people call crab apples, or I like to say pippins, apples that have grown from seed, when you've got these apples grown from seed, um, they're all, every one is different. Every tree is completely different and some hold their fruits longer than others. So um, many of them were denuded of apples, but one or two trees still had apples on them. And getting to pick those and eat them, so refreshing, the flavor in them compared to a supermarket apple or even apples from um, the orchard, but you know, that were harvested weeks ago. It's like this thing's still connected, still plugged into the tree. And there's a sort of vibrancy in the flesh of it. It's like, even if it was just that one thing, that one wild food, it's like start somewhere, harvest your own food. Uh, another one is eat from where you live. Now, this one's kind of brings me back to what I was talking about before. We have this internal saying here in the company, which is be made of place, you know, try to make your body out of the place where you live. I always thought about this. This is something that's been on my mind for a couple of decades. The idea that our bodies start being made of all of these different locations. So if you uh, were to import, you know, I live very close to Poland Springs, the uh, water bottling company. Um, Poland, Maine's not far from me. Uh, however, Poland Spring is no longer just sources their water there. They source from many different wells, but, but um, I see that water for sale when I travel. So sometimes I'll think, wow, you know, here I am all the way down in the Bahamas and people here are drinking the water uh, from Maine, their blood is made from their cerebral spinal fluid is their all their aqueous humors. <laughs> they're all made from Maine's water. It's so strange when you're that far away. Um, but then I've been in the same experience. Like I, I've had the same experience where I'm traveling, I'm in an airport and I'm drinking water from Fiji like what? I <laughs> couldn't be further from Fiji. So, you know, we do that and we, we're eating foods from all over the world. So it's kind of interesting when you go to the market and you start to look at the place of origin of the foods that you eat and start thinking like, whoa, wait a second. Do I even eat anything from here, like under my feet? And is it possible to make your body out of the place where you live? And I, I don't like to approach that from the, um, sort of place of guilt. I think there's this idea of like eating local that can sometimes start to be a little bit oppressive to people. And I don't mean to, to, to do that. There's certainly things from a way that I love to eat. Um, like I will probably never stop eating cacao beans. <laughs> really, really love eating cacao from South America. Um, you know, many people are just never going to stop drinking coffee and it's not coming from where they live. Right. So I don't mean it to be a hundred percent dogmatic exclusive, but more like, hey, can I start to build my body out of things that are from here? The side benefit of that being the impact it has on the ecology. So again, the food becomes the Trojan horse to affect how we treat our planet a little bit, right? So um, I think there's just a really cool opportunity in, in trying to build yourself out of your landscape. I mean, you'd be surprised at how much that you can actually do. Another one of our core values is uh, living a healthy lifestyle. Uh, again, not dogmatically but just with an eye toward it. 
this is something that was um, a major part of my last podcast. I was always looking at how do we build health through doing things that are natural for us? Um, and, you know, what are our sort of biological norms and how do we use that information to live healthfully in the way that, again, I don't mean this like um, it's often approached today. I mean it like if you were a zookeeper and you were in charge of taking care of an animal there, it wouldn't be about like uh, dogmatic approaches. It would just be like, it's my job to make sure the chimpanzees stay healthy. I got to make sure they get enough fiber. I got to make sure they get enough vitamins and minerals. Um, I got to make sure they get enough exercise. Not because it's important that they have six pack abs or not because uh, it's about uh, who can be the greenest, but because it's like, that's just your job to make sure to maintain their health, right? So you're like your own zookeeper. And I think it's important to maintain a healthy lifestyle. And one of the things I like about hunting, fishing, and foraging is not only is it the most nutritious food that you can really get access to. I mean, study after study will show you plants are a great example that the wild plant will have significantly more uh, of a vitamin, a mineral, an antioxidant than its domesticated counterpart. Uh, Similarly, when we eat wild animal foods compared to their domesticated counterparts, we'll find that they have a much healthier ratio of omega-3 fats to omega-6 fats. Um, When we look at myconutrients um, in, let's say, medicinal mushrooms that um, tend to be good for the immune system, well, we'll find that the wild-grown species is much richer in those than the domesticated counterparts. So some of it's just baked into the cake, so to speak. Um, that's a stupid saying to use (laughs) when you're talking about healthy living. Anyway, uh, some of it is just sort of baked in. And then also the exercise that comes with harvesting these things, um, or the time outside breathing fresh air, the time in nature being immersed in forests, for instance, we now know that just being immersed in forests has a health benefit, um, lowers blood pressure, for instance, things like that. So, um, there's health there's healthful practices that are built into this lifestyle. And I think it's important that we always build upon those. Another uh, core value uh, at WildFed is taking a multidisciplinary approach. So this isn't like a show where you, it's just for bow hunting or it's just for rifle hunters, or it's just for fly fishing only for us. It's, we like it all. I'm interested in all of it. Um, I, I don't, it doesn't matter to me what your, if your approach is like legal and it's ethical, uh, and ethical is, I mean, that's like an indi- up to individual interpretation, uh, legal is a little less ambiguous, but, um, if you're doing it in a way that's legal and ethical, I don't care what way you do it. Uh, so let me give you an example. Um, I like to, um, spin cast, but I know people that like to fly cast. And, um, I, I don't care (laughs) one way or the other. Sometimes I fly fish. Sometimes I fly fish because that's the approach that is, uh, legally required in that body of water. So recently I was in, um, Newfoundland, Canada. Uh, we made a great episode for season two of the video show up there. And, um, we were fishing for, uh, wild run Atlantic salmon. The laws are fly fishing only, barbless hooks. So it's really helpful to know how to fly fish. Uh, But if I had been allowed to use spinning gear, I would have because I'm more comfortable with it. Um, But it doesn't matter to me. There are places where uh, it's bow hunting only. For instance, uh, near the coastal parts of Maine, um, we have an area called the expanded archery zone. And it's archery only. It's a very urban place. Um, That's a, a useful tool in that environment. Uh, but if I'm in the interior and I can rifle hunt, I, I prefer to, um, I like to, as I mentioned before, I love spinning gear for fishing or conventional gear when I'm deep sea fishing. So, um, however, I also like to spear fish. And so sometimes what you'll get is these people who have sort of a, a dogmatic approach to one of these methods. 
Um, and there'll be a lot of argument. Well, like, which is better? And it's like, I don't, for me, that's not what this is ever going to be about. So we just kind of want to open it up to everybody. So if you're a fly, if you're a fly fishing aficionado, (laughs) I guess, uh, if you like to spin, if you like to bow hunt, if you like to rifle hunt, if you like to spear hunt, if you like to spear fish, if you want to use slingshots, like doesn't matter to us. The approach is multidisciplinary. We kind of are opening this up uh, and inviting everybody in, so to speak. Um, Another one of our core values is conservation through use. And I've been talking about that throughout this episode, the idea that it's very difficult to sell somebody on conserving something they don't use. So if I gave you $1,000 and I said you were never allowed to touch it, use it, spend it, you'll never benefit from it at all. Do you care if it gets spent? A lot less than if it's yours. Right. So similarly, if we use resources, we become more interested in conserving those resources. Uh, So I think that the hands off approach to nature is not really going to ultimately get us the effect that we want. Um, I have this story in my head of visiting Walden Pond, the famous Walden Pond. And when I got there, it was surrounded by a double corridor of um, chain link fence. So there was like a four foot wide corridor that you could walk in to walk around Walden Pond. So when Henry David Thoreau was talking about Walden Pond, writing about Walden Pond, spending time there, uh, could he have envisioned a double chain link fence where people would arrive en masse to walk through that corridor? I mean, I'm not, okay, again, I understand that this is a place with a lot of foot traffic and there are reasons that they have done that. Uh, But I grew up in the era of leave no trace. That was the approach to nature. Um, If you wanted to hike, backpack, camp, things like that, that was the approach. It was leave no trace. And I was taught not to interact with the landscape. And to me now, that's just such a kind of a tragedy, like the idea that people have been taught not to interact with landscapes, that they're afraid that they inherently are bad for the landscape. That's, I guess, really what I'm trying to say is that I think people have become convinced that human beings are somehow alien to earth. Somehow human beings are just inherently bad for the planet. This is not true, but our modern lifestyle has that impact. But human beings are a part of this life cycle. We're part of ecology. And if we're told to be hands off with nature, that feeling of being an alien to our home planet will increase. It will increase. Of course, it will increase. The only way for us to feel like we're part of it is for us to interact with it. So I really believe in conservation through use as opposed to a kind of hands-off environmentalism. Um, Another one of our core values is tending the modern wild. There's this understanding amongst people who have studied indigenous land use that there are ways of interacting with the land that cause it to be more productive. Um, And that a good example would be when Europeans arrived to the North American continent, the rich abundance that they experienced of flora and fauna was somewhat overwhelming to them, particularly having come from a denuded Europe. And it wasn't immediately apparent to them that this was the product of many, many, many generations, um, many thousands of years of tending to that landscape. Imagine it like permaculture, but for wild landscapes. So we believe that our um, harvesting practices need to be in, um, they need to be, they need to be done with a sort of eye to the future. Like how will our practices today impact this resource several generations out? And we need to use good practices, sustainable practices. And that means that sometimes we have to forego taking things that we would like to take, um, An example of that you'll see in episode one of the video show, We Harvest Wild Leeks here in Maine. Now, some of you live in places where ramps or wild leeks are very abundant. I live in a place where there's very few populations of them to be found, and those are generally very small populations. 
And I have a good friend, again, you'll see it in the episode, who is a steward of a very large, probably the most prolific wild leak patch in the state of Maine. Now, most people who use ramps pull up the whole plant and use the bulb. We take only the leaves. I would like to use the bulbs very much. I would very much like to. Uh, However, we leave them in the ground because uh, we could easily overwhelm Uh, That would be an additive mortality event. We would easily overwhelm their ability to reproduce and we would damage that resource. So we have to make harvesting decisions that are in alignment with that. Um, That's the same thing going on with our game management system here in North America, which is arguably the greatest game management system that's existed in modern civilization. So um, we every year, you know, if you're into hunting or fishing every year, you got to check the regulations because they change based on what biologists have learned coming from the research that they're doing. So sometimes, uh, let me, let me give you a great example of this here in Maine as well. Uh, we are allowed outside of those expanded archery zones I had mentioned, um, a little while ago, Mainers are allowed one deer per person per year, uh, with a hunting license. Now, a lot of people I talk to are kind of shocked by that because they live in places where you buy a hunting license and it comes with six tags. Like there are so, deer are so abundant, um, especially in places that grow a lot of corn or a lot of soy. Um, the deer are so abundant that there is a desire by game managers to reduce the number of animals on the landscape. So, you know, you can take a couple of bucks and several does because the does are the deer makers and they want to reduce the deer making a little bit. Uh, It's different than that here in Maine. We can take one deer. That's hard. I wish I could take more deer than that. I have to find ways to get more deer meat. So, you know, I end up doing, you know, some management um, of nuisance permits on farms. I end up uh, working uh, with the um, dispatch of our uh, sort of county resources to get road kills because, I need more deer meat, but I live in a place where it's one tag per person. And so I care more about the resource than I do about getting uh, more deer, right? So those are decisions we make that we call tending the, the, the modern wild. And that's really important to us as well. And then lastly is sustain our wild future. Um, I mean that in a couple of ways. Uh, obviously, you if you've been listening to this up until now, you know that I mean that in the sense of uh, species and landscapes. But I also care about sustaining our ability to hunt, fish, and forage into the future. Recently, um, this seems to have sort of died back a little bit, but here where I live, there was um, some legislation that had been introduced that was going to essentially ban foraging unless you personally owned the land or had been given you know, permission to, to, be, to forage on that landscape. But it was going to have very, very stiff penalties. And those kind of things, without input from foragers, that kind of legislation could uh, have tremendous impacts, not just on, you know, our ability to live a lifestyle like this, but on future generations ability to access nature. And so to me, this idea that foraging could go away, or the idea that there are very well funded organizations in the United States, for instance, that would like to see hunting go away, go away, like they would like to see it gone, your ability to hunt gone your ability to forage gone. Like, can you imagine uh, after three and a half million years of living like this, it's illegal um, to even practice it. So sustaining our wild future for me is also in addition to species, in addition to landscapes is about making sure that the practices of hunting and gathering stay alive. And that's one of the big reasons I started wild fed is to create more culture or to, to help all the people who are busy working on this to move the needle um, and make sure that we're preserving our relationship to wild nature. Uh, I just, that's tremendously important to me. As I sort of uh, close out, I wanted to kind of a couple things I want to say. One is I want to invite you to start thinking about one species that interests you. One species. It could be a plant, it could be a mushroom, it could be a seaweed, an algae, could be an animal. Uh, what's one species that could draw you out into nature? If you already have a lot of species you harvest from, I want you thinking about one more that you would like to learn. Something that you can get excited about. 
uh, you know, spring's still a little ways away and there's time to plan and there's time to think about it. So if you don't do this at all, what's one species that could get you going? It could be as simple as blueberries or raspberries or dandelions. You know, it could be, um, wild hogs or deer or ducks, Mm, ducks. Uh, but I want you thinking about that. I would love to invite you to add a wild species into your diet this year. Uh, something new. Uh, I also want to give a quick shout out to some of the folks that I have really inspired me with this project because uh, we're standing on the shoulders of a lot of folks who've done a lot of groundwork. And so I'm just going to share some of the shows that really inspired me. And maybe if you haven't seen some of these shows or uh, read the work of some of these folks or seen the videos of some of these people, it'll inspire you to uh, learn about them. Um, One, I want to just say a personal thanks to my friend, Arthur Haynes. I mentioned him a couple times now, and um, he has just had a powerful impact on my life. And um, without him, I, you know, I would not understand foraging at the, at the, paltry level that I do. Um, but he's really helped me uh, a lot. So please check out arthurhaines.com and um, his books, uh, his uh, Facebook forum, things like that. Uh, the author Sam Fair as well, who uh, is a colleague of Arthur's um, and who has probably written the most important foraging books of our generation. Uh, check out Sam's website, his courses, um, check out his book series, The Forager Harvest. Those are probably the best foraging books. Uh, if you live anywhere in the United States, I would recommend, or Canada, I would recommend that you get those books. Uh, very, very good stuff. I want to give a shout out to Kevin Kosowin, who makes a show called uh, From the Wild out of Canada. And his show really inspired me. He uh, does a show where they they are, they do forage. Uh, I think initially the early seasons, it was a lot more hunting and fishing. There's quite a bit of foraging going on now. In fact, a lot of it. Um, and they tend to bring chefs out into the field with them and, uh, do some cooking in the field uh, in each episode. You can see his show over on Vimeo. Um, he's got a paywall, so you, you know, but a very affordable show. Um, but check out, uh, from the wild, if you're interested in wild food content, really, really good stuff. Uh, I want to give a shout out to Steve Ornella, who I think has just, um, revivified hunting culture in, well, you know, you could say in, in the United States, but really I think his impact is now around the world. Um, and also his, uh, producer, uh, Giannis Patelis, they've the creators of the show meat eater and all the associated media that they're putting out now too. So if you've seen that show on Netflix, you know what I'm talking about. If you haven't checked that show out, it's fantastic, uh, primarily hunting, um, and some fishing that they do. Uh, but they've really brought the food aspect back to hunting in a way that had kind of started to, you know, just slip away a little bit. And hunting culture had become very sport focused, um, and very trophy focused. And uh, they've kind of, they're changing the the public image of hunting. So I really, really respect that. Uh, Hank Shaw is a fantastic uh, author of cookbooks on wild food and uh, his approach to wild food has had a huge impact on me. In fact, I reference his resources very frequently um, when I'm learning how to use a new ingredient. Um, I want to give a shout out to Kimmy Werner in uh, Hawaii, who uh, is a spear fisher. And uh, I just, man, check her out on Instagram. Kimmy Werner, a fantastic writer of little micro blogs on, on, um, on the gram and, uh, somebody I had on, uh, as an interview on, uh, rewild yourself. And she inspired me to start hunting below sea level. And that had a huge impact on me. I a guy named, well, a guy named guy, a guy named guy Turland. Uh, I don't know him personally, but part of why I decided to make the wild fed video show was because of two shows that I saw on Amazon prime by him. I believe he has a new show now um, that's on Taste Made. Uh, these were like 10 minute shows. They're um, probably just a handful of episodes per season. The first one is uh, called uh, Food to Die For, the other one is Farm to Plate. Both are awesome. Uh, I learned a lot from that and I just got inspired by the way they put the shows together. So, uh, fantastic stuff if you haven't seen that. Um, and lastly, I want to bring up Hugh Fernley Whittingstall, who 
maybe some of you listening will know his work. It's out of the UK and it's, he's a pretty big deal over there as I understand it here in the U S um, it's a little harder to find his stuff. Uh, but his show was called escape to river cottage. I think that was the first season. And then maybe it was called river cottage thereafter. Um, that brand is turned into, uh, you know, in-person events, books, you know, all kinds of amazing projects that he, he does in the UK. Uh, but his initial show was a huge ins- inspiration for me as well. Uh, he kind of starts off escaping the city and rents a place out in the, uh, countryside in Britain and, uh, decides he's going to start farming, hunting, foraging, things like that. And, uh, he's a chef and, um, creates just exquisite food out of what he was, uh, harvesting. And, uh, I'd say all of these folks kind of uh, put them in a bag, shake them up, and out comes, you know, Daniel Vitalis and Wildfed because, um, yeah, they they were all tremendous inspirations. Last couple things I want to talk about. I just want to let you know about some of the themes that we're going to be revisiting uh, on this show, um, about some upcoming episodes, and then again how you can see the video show and about a course that I have coming up. So. Um, There are several themes and a lot more than I've got listed here, but I'm just going to read off a few of them to you. Things that I think are going to be recurring here on the show. One of them is the idea of culinary adventure. I love the idea that um, we can create travel and excitement and adventure around food. So I think that's something that is going to be thematic here. Um, Methods of take are really interesting to me. I was talking about this before, and um, this is more on the hunting fishing side than it is on the foraging side, but um, I'm very interested in how things are done, what tools are used. I guess that actually does apply to foraging too, because I've had to innovate a lot of tools or find a lot of obscure tools for certain harvests that we do. Some harvests uh, you'll see in episode six of uh the wild fed video show where we go harvesting wild rice and you'll see sort of the really interesting implements that we use to do that um but also just you know the different tools um in season two you'll see us harvesting suckers with uh which is a a fish that runs into the uh brooks in the spring with you know 16 foot poles with a gig on the end of it you know i'm very i'm just fascinated by the tools of harvest so that's something that i think we'll be talking a lot about and i'm also interested in the arguments that take place as i was mentioning before between people who use different methods of takes so why spin fisher fishers are are in conflict sometimes with you know fly fishers or or why bow hunters sometimes look down upon rifle hunters or all you know all that kind of stuff i'm just fascinated by all that stuff so that's something i want to talk a lot about um ethics of killing are something that i want to revisit because it's such a um um, hot button topic right now in our culture and something as a former vegan uh and if you're you know i'm sure you can hear in how i discuss things that um I do have some thoughtfulness about this, um, but I also kill for my food. And so the ethics around that are really interesting to me and how we approach that. Uh, I'm very interested in the state of oceans and of fisheries. I think a lot of us have been hearing so many things about the state of our oceans and, and what's happening with the fish and marine mammals and, and, you know, uh, crustaceans and all, you know, all the species that inhabit our seas. And, you know, sometimes I see headlines that are so bleak. And then sometimes I go fishing and it seems so good. Um, so that's something I'm, I've, I've interviewed several people about now. Um, and you'll be hearing some of those interviews soon trying to get, I guess, um, a big picture overview of what are the state of our oceans. Uh, another one, I'm very interested in invasive species, um, particularly eating invasive species. I, you know, one of the things I covered in rewild yourself, the former podcast I did was this idea that invasive species, well, the, uh, the idea that some people don't like that language invasive species. In fact, there are people who get really mad about that and prefer to use different language. Um, And I mean, and I can kind of understand why in the sense that it's like, um, it's not like they came over invading. We, we typically move these species around humans, move these species around, and then we, we get mad that they're there. Um, so it's just this interesting topic, but also the impact that they have on landscapes. Episode four of the video show is about iguana hunting in Florida, where they have just a tremendous invasive species issue there, uh, where Florida has more non-native reptiles than native reptiles now. And 
Um, there are folks who feel like, hey, uh, this is just the new world we live in, so accept it. And there are other folks who are like, no, we have to stop these invasions. I'm not really taking a position. I just find the whole thing interesting. So it's something I want to talk about. Toxins in our environment, that's another one that comes up for me a lot, um, particularly in the um, well, it's, it's a plant and animal issue. I mean, there are certain plants in certain places that we harvest where there's parts of the plant we won't use due to contamination problems. Um, there are places we can't harvest altogether. There are issues with sometimes older animals versus younger animals, because the longer they've been alive, the more they bioaccumulate the toxins that we've put into the environment. So what impact that has on us, uh, and also what impact, of course, it has on the species and landscapes where those toxins are accumulating. Um, I'm very interested in local prohibitions on eating different species. So this is something you'll hear recurring a lot too. I find it really fascinating how a, something that is fished in one place and eaten with just relish and abandon in another place you go to, they think that that shouldn't even be eaten at all. And so this comes up a lot, especially uh, in fishing is one where I encounter it a lot. Um, I like eating lake trout here. Lots of places in the world, people like eating lake trout. <laughs> but, uh, but here where I live, people call it mud hen and say it tastes disgusting. Say it tastes like a lake bottom. I don't have, that's not the experience that I have, but that's what people say. Or we um, have uh, a fish here we call yellow perch that um, people don't think very highly of, but I know in New York, there's a big fishery for them. So I just find all that really, really interesting too. And I like to, um, try everything. So when people say it can't be eaten, I'm very interested in trying it. So we're going to be kind of covering a lot of those types of things, not necessarily whole episodes about these topics, but they're, they're going to be things you're going to hear woven through again and again, because they really, they really fascinate me. Okay. To kind of conclude, I'm going to tell you about how you can see the show and, uh, also about the program that I have coming up. So like I said, I've been spending the last two years making Wild Fed the video show and recording podcasts along the way. So I have got quite a few built up now. So you'll be hearing, I'm very excited for you to hear these shows because I've been sitting on them for a while, um, getting ready for this launch. So the video show is available right now uh, over at wild-fed.com for a price of $49. That's eight episodes of the show. The show is the individual episodes are 30 minutes long. So we didn't do the format of a typical television show that's, you know, a 30 minute television show is actually 22 minutes because they leave space for commercial breaks. We decided because we weren't launching in that, you know, arena or because we weren't going to those platforms to go with the full 30 minutes. And in fact, sometimes it's hard because there's a lot you want to leave in the shows, but we've decided to keep them at 30 minutes. So some of them are just under, some of them are just over, but they average 30 minutes long and there's eight in the entire season. And so those will be available for $49. If you want to see them right now, what the way this works is um, for our initial launch, you will get an episode a week starting in January, January 6th. And we're going to give you one episode a week for eight weeks. The reason is because concurrent with that, we're running a program. Uh, so it's called the Wild Fed Season 1 Experience. This is a nine-week program. Uh, I'm really excited because it's going to put me in touch with all of you. So here's how it will work. Um, it starts January 6th. Each week you get an episode of the Wild Fed Video Show. You'll get a director's cut version of that show as well. So you get the 30-minute episode, but then you'll get a much longer form episode where I'll be walking you through what you're actually seeing and telling you kind of the behind the scenes stories of what happened. Um, sometimes there's some intrigue we have to remove or things that happen that are kind of off the wall or, um, you know, maybe there's a deeper bit of story than I'm able to tell in the 30 minute format. You'd be surprised at how little you can get across in 30 minutes sometimes. So um, sometimes I want to really expand on something, but don't have the space for it. So I'm going to be walking you through the episode in a little bit longer form. Um, there'll be uh, also, so uh, uh, nine live structured Q and A. So each week there'll be another Q and A. That's where you can kind of ask direct questions. Uh, but I'm going to structure it so that each week there'll be a specific topic, so that we don't just range all over the place. But that over the course of the nine weeks, you get um, a good picture built up about the lifestyle and how you can get involved in it. So um, you'll have the episode each week, the director's cut 
each week and the structured Q&A. Additionally, this whole thing's going to take place in a private member forum. So you'd be in there with other folks who are like-minded, where you'll be able to be in discussion with them, where you can post things, uh, where you can have discussions, and then also where myself and the team will be moderating in there as well. So you'll have access to me for those nine weeks, uh, in addition to having access to me in the q and A's. So this is... Um, going to be a really fun process because we can kind of build some community together there. So that's the wild fed season one experience. So the that's $249 and the show on its own is $49. Now, after that program's done running after those nine weeks, uh, you'll be able to purchase the show at $49 and just get the whole show in bingeable format like you're used to um, on something like Netflix. But I want to make sure that the people who go through that program with me, that they uh, don't get any spoilers along the way. So again, for $49 for the show, eight episodes. So, uh, I guess that's four hours of content. And then, um, if you want to get the rest of all that content, join me over in the wild fed season one experience. I'd really like to have you there. Um, wild fed is new and fledgling, and I'm really excited to build this community together with you. So, um, lastly, everything, like I said, is at wild dash fed.com. Um, if you have uh, feedback for me, if you have any uh, suggested episodes or guests, if you think you'd make a great guest for the show, if you have a hunting, fishing, or foraging trip you want to invite us on to make an episode about, hit us up at info at wild-fed.com. Um, that's a direct email to us there and um, let us know what you're thinking. And lastly, uh, go ahead and sign up for our email list, our, our, e our newsletter called The Subscribe assistance uh, is going to come out twice a month. And uh, I promise that's great content. That's not going to be, um, you know, just uh, pushing this or pushing that. It's going to be content driven. So um, twice a month, just I think like uh, less than that's not enough. And more than that can kind of feel a bit overwhelming. So, um, so join the subsistence over at our uh, website, and then you uh, can find more about me, what I'm doing, kind of what I'm writing about and all of that over at my Instagram account at Daniel Vitalis. And if you're wanting to be in touch with me at all, that's probably your best place to go. I'm most active on that social network. Um, I try to answer a lot of comments there. I can't get to all the DMs. I can't get to every comment, but uh, I try to be as engaged as I can over there, particularly on the day I post. So um, if I put up a new post on Instagram, I'm, I'm pretty on top of comments there. So if uh, you have something you want to pass directly to me, um, go ahead and comment on the day that you see my posts go live, uh, and that'd be your best chance at getting in touch with me personally. Um, thank you so much for listening to this show. Uh, we're going to be bringing lots of awesome interviews. And like I said, I'm extremely excited and proud about the video show too. So I hope you'll check out both the podcast and the video show, and I'll be back next Tuesday with another episode of wild fed. Thanks for listening to the Wild Fed Podcast. You can help us grow this show by subscribing and leaving us a rating and review. It ensures better rankings and more advertiser interest, which translates directly into better shows, more awesome guests, and a constant stream of fresh new content. Have a question you'd like answered on the show or a hunting, fishing, or foraging trip you'd like to host us on? Email us at info at wild-fed.com. And be sure to visit our website, wild-fed.com to check out the Wild Fed video show and store. Wild Fed. Food is all around you.